18 years ago today, the defining tragedy of my generation took place on September 11th, 2001. I'm of course referring to the destruction of the World Trade Center and the partial destruction of the Pentagon and the attempted destruction of either the White House or the Capitol building. Um, which was foiled by the passengers of Flight United 93. This was a day when 3,000 people in the United States died. And whenever this day comes up, people always talk about how they remember exactly where they were on the day that this happened. They remember where they were, who they were with, what they were doing. I was really young when this happened. I was born in 1994, so I was still a pretty young kid when 2001 rolled around. And I have a memory about when I first learned the news of this tragedy. I remember being in a house. It wasn't my house. It was the house of some of my parents' friends. I remember it being very wide, much wider than it was long. Remember that I was in the room on the farthest left-hand side of the house, watching it happen on the news, on the TV. But I'm not sure if that memory is real. That's the weird thing about it. It's because I have an equally real memory of that house where I remember watching on that same TV something else. For some reason, in my head, I've of the World Trade Center attack. And I'm not sure about this memory, but it's always stuck with me. And that got me thinking how many generational defining tragedies the things that stick in people's heads, the things that define parts of their lives and also the political life of a nation, how many of those memories are fallible? That's not to discount anyone's account of it, but emotional memories, especially for big tragedies, seem very fallible. Recently, I've been reading a lot of essays by George Orwell. Many of these essays are written mid-World War II. He's writing a lot of essays about fascism at a time when it wasn't clear who would win the war. And the type of world that George Orwell is discussing in these essays is very different from the picture that we get when we're taught history later type of world he's discussing is one where the question of fascism, specifically, and also of leftist principles, uh, George Orwell, of course, being a socialist, are not decided. They're not decided issues. And, of course, these things weren't decided. The war wasn't over yet. But that isn't the picture that we get. We don't get the picture of the debate or the ongoing uncertainty about who would win when we read modern day accounts of the war. But reading these essays, which were published during the process of the war, we see a very different world. And so I've thought a little bit about the generational defining tragedies of the World War II generation, those being the Great Depression and the bombing of Pearl Harbor. The Great Depression is a long, drawn-out economic memory as much as it is a human and emotional tragedy. And what I really want to focus on is the Pearl Harbor attacks. The attack on Pearl Harbor motivated the U.S. to join the war. There are some arguments about whether the U.S. was planning on joining the war anyways, but those are kind of besides the point. Those are what tip the scale towards joining the war, and it's also what was the defining moving point 
for the American populace. It's what got people to start enlisting. And that defined, that sense of an attack on America, motivated people to join this war. And it also led to the internment of Japanese Americans. And so, when we think about this, these big generational memory-defining tragedies often end up being the tipping points in politics and in sort of the national sense of self. In World War II, after the attack on Pearl Harbor, America started to see itself as a nation under attack. The people saw themselves as a nation at war. The same happened again after 9-11. We started seeing ourselves as a nation at war. At the time, we weren't totally sure who we were at war with. When it first happened, it wasn't clear. Eventually, we found out that Al-Qaeda was responsible for these attacks, and that their leader, Osama bin Laden, had fled to Afghanistan. He was being harbored by the Taliban. And that gave the U.S. an excuse to declare war. Declaring war in Afghanistan makes sense, but it also has some weird points. So it makes sense in terms of the let's bring Osama bin Laden to justice standpoint. The idea that we should capture him, make him pay for his crimes, and by capturing him, we would weaken his organization. All of that makes sense. But extending that goal to the whole nation of Afghanistan and participating in a nation-building exercise does not logically follow from that initial war goal of capturing Osama bin Laden. The much more obviously controversial thing to come out of 9-11 and the ongoing war on terror was the invasion of Iraq. Invading Iraq has even less to do with 9-11 than the nation-building goals in Afghanistan. It was not connected to 9-11. But the politics of it aren't what I'm really that interested in right now. In my head, as a child, all of these events were completely linked. This was what the propaganda I was being fed was. This was what my small child mind was doing to try and make sense of this tragedy that was so enormous that I couldn't really understand it. And so growing up, a big part of what I was as a child was as someone entranced by the idea of fighting in a just war. I spent most of my childhood, and all the way up through college, planning to join the military and thinking about what it would be like to go to war for a just cause. I can go into how I eventually turned towards pacifism at a later point, but that's sort of besides the point right now. What matters to me at this moment is that this memory, 9-11, this memory that I've already established is a composite of different images, defined who I was growing up. And I think it probably defined a lot of people. It is, as I said before, the defining tragedy of a certain generation. And for the upcoming generation, that's gone. Children who were too young to remember it at all, or children who were born much later than 2001 are in their late teens. Some children who were born in 2001 are 18 now. They're, they're adults, and they don't have the same memory of 9-11. And yet we still have troops in Afghanistan. I find that really odd. This is a war that they are completely disconnected from. And yet some of them are old enough to serve in the military and be deployed to Afghanistan. But that got me thinking, what is the new generation defining tragedy for the new generation? And it seems like the really obvious answer is the upswing in the number of mass shootings. When I was a child, I felt safe. I felt that America was safe. Maybe that was just the community that I was raised in, Maybe it was just the demographics of, of who I am. I am a white, 
suburbanite from Texas, I, I felt safe growing up. This new generation whose new tragedy defining them is not one single incident isolated to the East Coast. It's a series of completely random killings by psychopaths with access to guns. They don't have any reason to feel safe. Their new generation defining tragedy is not a cause for war. It's a complete shift in the structure of American society. The whole country is the Wild West. And I think that is horribly tragic. I'm interested to know what other people think about this, about the idea of a generation-defining tragedy. And also, if my belief that the new generation simply just doesn't feel safe uh, is true. So let me know in the comments. Um, maybe I'll make more of these videos. I don't know. I think I have more stuff to say. Maybe not about this specific topic. Um, but we'll see.